Is it okay now? Yes, yes, Marge. You can hear me now, everyone? Yes, we can hear. Okay. So, uh, maybe we'll begin with some invocation prayers. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Gura Shri Yata Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavanishwari Vrishabhanu Sate Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Namaum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavari Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nanda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so on behalf of Srila Prabhupada, founder Acharya of the Hare Krishna movement, welcome everyone to this uh, unit of Bhakti Shastri. Prabhupada desired devotees in ISKCON study the scriptures in a systematic manner and for that purpose he did designed these different courses. So. Very nice, so many of you are participating in this activity, Bhakti Shastri. I also studied these scriptures before in Vrindavan in the 1980s. I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement in 1971 in the UK, in London. And I was fortunate enough to get initiation from Srila Prabhupada. Later on, I took sannyas in uh, 94 here in Mayapur. So, for more last 25 years more, I've been engaged, fully engaged in traveling and preaching. My field is in far eastern part of the globe, places like Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand and then Hong Kong, Taiwan, China, Far Eastern Russia, these places. So there also we teach these courses. So it's very nice that in Dubai you're also studying. I just want to share with you some uh, points here. Let me just open this and show you. Um,
Bear with me while I find this document. Okay, here we are. This is actually your unit 5, it may be, but uh, in previous cases it was. Sometimes we reshape, remodel the courses. But anyway, we're, this section is concerned with molecular unit, first of all, to deepen this understanding of the workings of the three modes of material nature, sattva, rajas and tamas, as described in chapters 13 to 18 of Bhagavad Gita, as it is. So we'll be looking at these three modes of nature, studying them. Very important for us to understand the characteristics of these modes then we can identify when we're being influenced by these modes, which modes they're influenced. So the unit aims to help students identify the symptoms of the three modes, become more aware of how these modes may be influencing them. Right? You know devotees, we're very uh, happy to be devotees and we often think, I'm a devotee, I'm transcendental. <laughs> but you know, devotional service can also be influenced by the modes of nature. And then another aim, to equip students with skills required to elevate themselves and ultimately transcendence. Right? So, this is the idea. We want to bring ourselves up to the mode of goodness and then from the mode of goodness, then we can transcend. So we hope in the course next, uh, I think, 10 lessons usually I take to teach the section of the Bhagavad Gita. 10 sections. We're meeting three times a week, Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays at the same time. So I hope you'll stay with me and participate and complete this uh, unit. It's not difficult. It's just, this is one of the easier sections. We'll be looking at the entanglement in the modes of nature. <clears throat> Actually, this is not, not this evening, but we'll go on to that. We have to first of all cover the 13th chapter, which will bring us to understand more how the modes of nature work. So the modes of nature is chapter 14. Then the Banyan Tree, Purushottam Yoga, 15, Divine and Demonic Natures, 16, the Divisions of Faith, Chapter 17, and then one more, Chapter 18, the Perfection of Renunciation. So, short chapters, not very... We're going to have a, a review. Chapter 13, in consciousness. So, oh, sorry, my fonts are not correct. Please forgive me. Shetra, it should be Shetra, Shetragna. That's this evening, the first seven verses. To go very far tonight, we're going to look at the, the, these first seven verses, which introduce this topic of the Shetra, Shetragna. And then we go on to the process of knowledge, verses 8 to 12. The object of knowledge, Prakriti, Purusha, their union. And then Jnana Chaksus, the vision, the vision of knowledge. So this is how 
the chapter is divided up. You can see these five different sections. Of course, everybody, you know, it's not you may like to analyze the chapter in a different way. Everybody has their own particular vision in looking at the chapter. But these are the uh, general headings. We don't say you have to follow, have to accept these headings. You may like to divide the chapter up some other manner. But these topics are definitely there in this chapter. Okay, so we're going to Okay, coming back to uh, the video here. So, I want you, you should have a Bhagavad Gita with you. We're going to begin this 13th chapter. I'll just read the English, I'll, I'll leave this, I'm sure your Sanskrit's better than mine, so uh, I'll just read the English to you. He said, O oh my dear Krishna, I wish to know about Prakriti, nature, Purusha, the enjoyer, and the field, and the knower of the field, and knowledge, and the object of knowledge. So this is Arjuna's question. Arjuna's got good questions, encouraging Krishna to speak more on this transcendental science, right? So he wants to know about prakriti, nature. There's divine material nature and the spiritual nature. Entities you should understand we are also prakriti. That was described earlier in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, that would be in chapter uh, we're talking which chapter? Anyway, oh chap is it chapter seven? Am I right? Or, yes, I think chapter 7, the living entity is described as Apariyamitvasyanyam prakritim vidime param jiva buddha mahabaho yeyidam daryatejakat. Krishna was describing the material nature. First of all, he described the material energy. And then he went on to say, hey, this Arjuna, there's another energy, another energy of mine, which are all living entities, right? So this is the also prakriti. So here Arjuna wants to understand about not just only prakriti but also purush. Now in Hindi you also use the word purusha describing that's a word for male I think in Hindi language. I don't know Hindi but I, I know a few words. I've seen a few words. I can read the Hindi writing. So uh, purush. I see it. You're looking for a toilet, they write for the gents, they put Purush, right? And so Purush means the enjoyer. Actually there's only one enjoyer, one supreme enjoyer. But we're all tiny enjoyers. We are also trying to enjoy. So Arjuna wants to know about the Pakriti, Purusha, the field, the north of the field, the field. That was that is the word Shetra. And the nor of the field, Shetrakna. So the field, we'll hear about this, we'll explain about this in a minute. Then he wants to know also about knowledge and the object of knowledge. So Arjuna's about six topics. Now it's interesting to note that when Krishna replies, he doesn't start with the Prakriti and the Purush, because that's the most complex of the, the six topics. Start with the easy things. So Arjuna, Krishna does this. 
we'll see Krishna replies, text number two. This body or son of Kunti is called the field, and one who knows this body is called the knower of the field. All right? Before we go into this, let us look at Prabhupada's purport, because Srila Prabhupada has given some important comments in the purport. Just, I'm just going to look at the, the second paragraph in the purport here. It's the last, there's only two paragraphs, so the second paragraph in the purport to text one and two. I will read it for you. In the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, the knower of the body, the living body, and the position by which he can understand the Supreme Lord are described. In the middle six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the relationship between the individual soul and the super soul in regard to devotional service are described. The superior position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the subordinate position of the individual soul are definitely defined in these chapters. The living entities are subordinate under all circumstances, but in their hopefulness, in, in their forgetfulness, they are suffering. When enlightened by pious cities, they approach the Supreme Lord in different capacities, as the distress those in want of money, the inquisitive, and those in search of knowledge, also described. So Prabhupada is of course referring to that verse, which is from the seventh chapter, describing four kinds of people who surrender to him. So in this way Prabhupada is summarizing what has been taught in the, these first 12 chapters and now he says, now starting with the 13th chapter, how the living entity comes into contact with material nature and how he is delivered by the Supreme Lord through the different methods of fruitive activities, cultivation of knowledge and the discharge of devotional service are explained. Although the living entity is completely different from the material body, he somehow becomes related. This also is explained. So Srila Prabhupada is, of course you will know, you know very well, I hope, the Bhagavad Gita is 18 chapters and it's in three sections. Just as you've been studying it, you've completed the, the first section, the first six chapters, described where the yoga ladder was described, and you heard how bhakti was at the top of the yoga ladder, and then you went on, no point, there's no need to worship different demigods, simply by worshipping Krishna one can achieve everything, and he's the master, we're the servant. This is the problem. It's hard to remember, right? We all like to be the purusha. We all like to be the enjoyer. We want to be the controller. We want to be the one in charge. But we have to learn we're subordinate. We're tiny, insignificant. So in this way, uh, we come to this 13th chapter and Arjuna wants to understand these different terms. So Krishna begins, as we heard, uh, second verse, he says, This body, O son of Kunti, is called the field. One who knows this body is called the knower of the field. So the field, the body is like a field. Just like a farmer 
goes to the field and he can plant, he can work the field, grows vegetables, grows rice, grows wheat, whatever he grows in the field. Many people just grow potatoes nowadays, huh? Grow potatoes. So whatever he's going to do with the field, use it to cultivate something that's good use of the land. The same way with we use the body for our activities. So the body is like a field. We, say, we talk about karma kanda, right? Working for the body, for the maintenance of the body. We have to work, we have to maintain the body. And so without the body, if the body is diseased, if the body is in, incapacitated, then very difficult to work. The same way you get some field, some, field, some land is very fertile, and everything grows very quickly, just like here in Mayapur, because we're near the Ganga. So the Ganga basin is there, so the land is very fertile. So things grow very well, very quickly. We can see here in Mayapur, flowers are growing, so many vegetables can grow also. They grow a lot of rice, and the, more, more so in the rainy season. So like this. So within the body, there's a knower of the body. One should understand that we're not the body, that we are living in the body. This body, as you've learned earlier in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, it goes from the childhood to the youth to the old age. The body is changing. But the person is the same, right? We see our bodies change, but we are still the same. We have the same, the same name, the same passport. You know, we, who, who, who are we? So we are living in the body. We are the knower of the body. So this is the position of the living entity. However, we're going to learn from Lord Krishna that there's not just one knower in the body. There's another. There are two knowers in the body. However, this is a controversial point and Lord Krishna will deal with it in a few verses. We'll see. But the first thing is to understand the body is the field, the Kshetra, the field of activities, and we are the Kshetrakna, the knower of the field. Now, I know about my body. I don't know about your body. I don't know right now, are you listening, or are you sleeping, what are you doing, what are you playing with? You know, I, I'm not able to see any, each and every one of you, but uh, I hope you're listening and paying attention. Uh, my point is, I know about myself, I don't know about others. So, we are limited to, even, even our own bodies we don't even know very much about. We're not able to understand when our body's diseased, we don't know what's wrong with it. We know the symptoms, but we don't know why these symptoms are there. So we cannot even understand our own body, what to speak of others. In trying to present spiritual knowledge, to understand from the body that we are in the body, but we are not the body. We're living in the body. Just like you enter an apartment, it doesn't mean you become the apartment. Or Prabhupada used to talk about cars. You know, in Prabhupada's time in India, there was only ambassador cars. And so Prabhupada would often say, the man is in the, his car and he is thinking, I am ambassador. And he's thinking, 
the way rickshaw. Get out of the way. I am ambassador. <laughs> so like that. We're, we're in, in the motor car. We identify with the vehicle. So the same way, the body is a vehicle and we are identifying with it. If somebody won't accept this point, then you're going to have a very difficult time to try to preach to him. This is a, something which we have to really get into people, to give, in, 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 by way of giving people spiritual education. The first thing we want to teach them is, you're not the body, you're a soul different from the body. It, it's not easy to understand because we are conditioned, because we've been in this material world for many births. And every birth we've been thinking, I'm the body. So it's very difficult, it's a big change in consciousness to understand that I'm not the body, I'm different from the body. I am the knower of the body, but at the same time different from the body. About this, Prabhupada writes in the first paragraph, a living conditioned soul can thus understand that he is different from the body. It is described in the beginning, Dehino Smin. Right? I think you've all learned that verse. That the living entity is within the body and the body is changing from childhood to boyhood and from boyhood to youth and from youth to old age. And the person who owns the body knows that the body is changing. The owner is distinctly Shitragna. Sometimes we think, I am happy, I am a man, I am a woman, I am a dog, I am a cat. These are all bodily designations of the knower. But the knower is different from the body. Although we may use many articles, clothing, etc., we know that we are different from the things used. Similarly, we also understand by a little contemplation that we are different from the body. I or you or anyone else who owns the body is called Shikhtragna, the knower of the field of activities. And the body is called Shikhtra. The different examples to convince, to convince uh, people about not being the body. One time we took Srila Prabhupada to a school and Srila Prabhupada asked for a, a young boy, he asked, he said, who is the most intelligent, asked the young boy, all right, I want you to point to your left arm and then now point to your left leg, now point to your head, now po point to you. Where are you? So then the little puzzled when he had to point to himself. But Prabhupada said, you showed me your body, you showed me your arm, your leg, your head. Where are you? You are the possessor of the body. You are owner of the body. Where are you? In this way, Srila Prabhupada was presenting knowledge of the knower of the field to these children in the school. Very important point of spiritual education. Any questions on this so far? No questions? Okay, we'll go ahead. Looking on text number three. O sign of Bharat, you should understand that I am also the knower of all bodies. To understand this body and its knower 
is called knowledge. That is my opinion. So, asked about, you wanted to know what is knowledge and the object of knowledge. So here we have what is knowledge. And we also learn that there's another knower in the body, another shape tragna. Because Krishna says, Sharp Shetragyam Chapi Mamvidi. Krishna is saying, I am also the knower in all I'm the knower in us. We know our own body, but Krishna knows each and every living entity's body. He's all pervading everywhere in the heart of every living entity. Srila Prabhupada would sometimes remark, just think how busy Lord Krishna must be. Because he's everywhere, in everyone's heart. And he's guiding, making arrangements for everyone. As, of course, in his expansion as a super soul, he's very busy. So, Krishna says, I am also the knower in all bodies. And to understand this body, and the body and its knower is called knowledge. Now, some people, on reading this verse, they, I think Ankaracharya, of course, when he reads this verse, when he interprets this verse, he says that, yes, I, I am in, I am the knower in all bodies. It's me. Because Shankaracharya is presenting the Advaita philosophy, hmm. the, or the Mayavadi philosophy. He's presenting this uh, impersonalism, monism. So he's saying that we're all one. I know I'm in everyone's body, you are all, I know you, you know me, we're all one. This is the Mayavada philosophy is preaching the personal philosophy, not impersonalism. And Srila Prabhupada would sometimes remark that if someone says they are God, he says, then you can tell them, I am also God. And then Prabhupada said, I am the kicking God, and I am kick on your head. <laughs> Because Prabhupada said, if you are God, then how is it, you, you, you're, if you are God, you should know everything. But you don't know anything. And you're claiming that you're God. So God means one who knows everything. But who is there who knows everything? We, know, we don't even know about our own bodies. How can we know about everyone's body? And so it's a ludicrous statement to say that everyone is God. Of course, we're all tiny parts of God, but we're not God. As Prabhupada has been pointing out earlier, we're all servants. We have a relationship with him. He's the master and we're the servant. It's like that, a relationship. So. Arjuna, uh, Krishna is presenting this information to Arjuna. He's saying that one who understands the body and its knower, it, or, or to understand the body and its knower is called knowledge. So knowledge means to understand the body, what we call as the field of activities, and then the knower of the field of activities. And there are two knowers of the field. There are two shetraknas, the knowers of the field. There is the atma and the param atma. There's the individual living entity and there is the super soul, the all pervading Lord. So the all pervading Lord, we know about our own situation. We're individuals, we're finite, but the Lord is infinite. So, 
this is the important point to understand here. We have to be prepared to challenge people who present this uh, impersonalist philosophy. The, uh, the line, in the line of Madhva Acharya, one of the principles which Lord Chaitanya drew from the Madhva Sampradaya was the absolute refutal of the impersonal philosophy and establishing the personal siddhanta, that the living entity is Lord. Because it, in the impersonal teachings, they claim that the, living, that the living entity is one with God, that there's only the indi one individual, the one entity. There's, there's only the oneness, there's, n there's no duality. So we have to challenge this. There was an interesting event took place one time. One of the devotees was out preaching, distributing books. And in the course of his uh, book distribution, he met another young man. This was in America, quite a few years ago. So the young man was saying, you know, the devotee was trying to introduce the book to him and encouraging him to purchase one of the books. And he was telling him, you read this book, you'll know about God. And the other man was trying to tell the devotee, oh, I'm God, you're God, we're all God. It's all one. Don't you know? It's all one. And so then the devotee said to this man, oh, really? It's all one. Okay. So if it's all one, you give all the money you have in you give it to me. And give me also your car keys. So the man said, okay, here, take my wallet. Here, take my car keys. The devotee said, yes, because it's all one. You should give, give your money to me, it doesn't matter. I'm you, you're me, it's all one. So the man, th this other young man, was being tested, so I thought, all right, here, take my, mo take my wallet, take my keys. And so the devotee took them and said, thank you very much. And he said, here, you can have one of our books, take our book to read it. And he was walking away, and then the man said, hey, just a minute, don't go away yet. You, ha you didn't give me back my car keys. You so the, the man's philosophy was being put to the test, you see. He was speaking something, but he couldn't apply that philosophy. So it's a ridiculous philosophy. It can be de you can defeat these people quite easily. But often, of course, because this is Kali Yuga, people don't like to admit defeat. They don't like to be defeated. They won't admit they're wrong. They'll just keep arguing and arguing. Prabhupada was uh, questioned one time by a magazine named Bhavan's Journal, published in India. And the reporter had a number of very interesting questions for him. And one of the questions was, he was asking Prabhupada, who's right, the Dvaitas or the Advaitas? Which one is correct? So on this occasion, Prabhupada said, they're both correct. Let them both chant Hare Krishna. So we don't like to waste time arguing foolishly with people. Better just let them chant Hare Krishna. And if they can engage in some devotional, if they can do some spiritual activity, like if they can join in the kirtan, or they can chant, they can take prasadam, then very good try to elevate them to a higher understanding. So knowledge means the field of activities and the two knowers of the field of activities, the Atma and the Paramatma. This is real knowledge. Can I ask a question? Yeah? When you, when you say uh, the body, uh, uh, the Shetra. Shetra means is the only body or the apart from body the material nature, the matter also included in that. Shetra. 
constituents of the field of activity. The, the different elements of the field of activity of the field of activity the body will be listed for us. I think 26 elements or 24 elements according to how we analyze them. You see the different elements are there. We're talking about the particular the, the body which we're living in. Uh, the diff the which work knowledge acquired knowledge acquiring senses and working senses. There's sense objects. There's also the subtle body. So these things are this is the, these are the constitu constituents of the, the body, the field of activities. Then from the body we do get different feelings and emotions which come. You know, interactions of the different uh, interactions of the subtle body, different feelings are. Is that all right? It's going to be described, it comes actually in text number six and seven. We're going to see the, the description is given of the, the, the field of activities and the interactions of the field of activities. Yeah. Any other questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, I have one question. This first question that Arjun has put to Krishna, and he's this is he's asking in a very uh, technical language that you know prakriti and the field and the knower of the field, but these topics have already been discussed, like. Uh, atma, Paramatma, and body. So, is there any specific reason for Arjun asking this in a very, uh, it's like a very academic language? So, well, th they've been discussed, but only discussed briefly. For one thing, the, the, the nature of the field of activities was not described to be just explained. What are the different elements of the field of activities? And then, uh, sorry, Arjuna wants to understand more about the the knower of the field. Is it is is there simply one, or are there two? So there will there will be just uh, Krishna will explain. He will give some evidence on this, establishing why we should accept the duality, that there's not just simply one knower of the field, but there are two. There's also the Super-Soul. So he, how, uh, this will be explained in verse number 5, and how, how to, why we accept this conclusion, not to be just uh, accepted blindly. So Krishna is making these points to establish these conclusions properly and then we're going to, it will go on to explain how the modes of nature uh, interact on the living entity, how they affect the living entity. Okay, so we'll look at text number four. You can see Krishna's saying, uh, Now please hear my brief description of the field of activity and how it is constituted. What its changes are? Whence it is produced? Who that knower of the field of activities is? And what his influences are? So all of these points are going to be uh, given to us. Let me see, I think I'll just show you something on that. Yeah, here you can see 
I've written here. Krishna gives five points which will be expanded on in this chapter. Number one, how the body is constituted. Verse number six, first the body is described. Then the changes of the body. Verse seven, and also again then in 20. When and where the body is produced, that will come verse 6, 21 and 22. Then the identity of the knower of the field of knowledge, verses 14 to 18, and then again in 23, and the influence of the knower, verses 14 to 18. So this verse number four, Krishna is just preparing us for what he is going to present in this chapter. Okay, so we're going to go on now to an important verse. Verse number five. Maybe we can all chant it together. Rishi beer bahuda gitam beer vividai pritak. Brahma sutra padais chaiva hetu mad beer vinish chitai. That knowledge of the field of activities and of the knower of activities is described by various sages in various Vedic writings. It is especially presented in Vedanta Sutra with all reasoning as to cause and effect. Brahma Sutra, we know it, you may know it as Vedanta Sutra. Uh, of course, Srila Vyasadeva has given us this book, very important. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he got criticism because when he came to Benares, he was not mixing with the Mayavadi sannyasis and still were doing. They thought he did not know Vedanta. But, of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu knew very well Vedanta, the conclusion. <laughs> He, he's, a, he's the knower of us. By all the Vedas, he is to be known. So here, Lord Krishna has made an important statement. He, we see Krishna, although he is Bhagavan and he is the Supreme Lord himself, and he's already said earlier, there's no truth superior to me. But here, Lord Krishna is referring to scriptures. He says here, that knowledge of the field of activities and of the knower of activities is described by various sages in various writings. So Lord Krishna is showing us the importance of sadhu and shastra original guru is the guru of everyone to consider why do we need to have shastra first of all why is it not enough just simply to have a guru and sadhus why do we need to also have shastra maybe some of you can what you can do you can write down some points or some reasons why we need to have spiritual life. Is it not enough just to hear from the Would someone like to contribute? Would they like to offer their evaluation? Hare Krishna. Hare 
Sahib Ji, we are, we are Subhanda, we will forget. So when the Guru or uh, Sadhus explain us the things, what to be done in our life, we may forget at some time. So when we have the staff class, the Guru and the Sadhu uh, come, come time, so that we can, we can refer the Shastras. Okay. So you're saying we can't really rely on the Guru without having... Yeah, we, can, we can rely on the Guru, but when we are not with the Guru at all time, since we, are, we may forget what Guru told to us, so we want some reference to again to ourselves. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, may, we may not be able to remember everything the Guru said, so we hope that the Gurus... But, so Shastra, give us something. To, someone else? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. One side you and one side uh, Bhagavad Gita and explaining to us. So it's like a medium uh, to listen uh, to Guru. So, so Guru, Guru, but what, what about the Shastra? Why is it we have to have Shastra as well as Guru and Sadhu? <laughs> These Shastras are uh, manual instructions um, uh, which are recorded by the Acharyas, so which becomes the base for the forthcoming uh, mankind to uh, take this as a base to propagate Krishna consciousness. So, and these are the truth and uh, they will never change or they, sometimes the words of the Guru can be misinterpreted but the, shastra, the words or the literatures that are given in the Shastra are the same. So, uh, Oh, oh. Okay, yeah, this is something good. I can appreciate this point, what you're saying, Maharaji. Yeah, that sometimes the, gu the Guru's words may be misinterpreted and there should be something to confirm the teachings of the Guru. So the Shastra are, Shastras are eternal knowledge. They don't change. Gurus, they come... Different gurus come with different messages, different philosophies. It should be supported by Shastra, what they're speaking. Yeah. Yes, Thank you. Okay. So, yes, Prabhu. Someone else. Uh, Maharaj, this is uh, Maharaj, even uh, to understand the sadhu, whether he is a really sadhu or not, then we need to refer. Uh, we have to judge the as because there, uh, there may be some bogus sadhu also uh, in the world, you know. So, I mean, to understand whether he is a really sadhu or not, yes. we need to uh, see whether he is maintaining or uh, leading his life as per the Shastra. That's a very nice point, yes, right. There has to be some standard to know who is actually the sadhu and, or who is guru. The, there should be some clear standards and the, 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 what they're doing and saying it should be supported by Shastra. The Shastras is the absolute authority. Okay, very good. So what if we just have Shastra and, and Guru without sadhus? Will that be a problem? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances, Hans Gopaldas. Maharaj, uh, like it said that uh, uh, Nikama Kalpatulu Galitam Phalam. So it's the ripened fruit. Like if we take the analogy of a ripened fruit, which is let's say a mango uh, on, a, on a tree, if it comes and falls on the ground directly, it will spoil. So unless there is a guru who is giving us this in disciplined succession, we will not be really be able to receive it as is. The so Guru is a transparent media which gives us that ripened fruit, but in a very, uh, you know, palatable or let's say in a, in a proper way, in a, in a uh, way as it is. So maybe that Kalitam Phalam is needed uh, through a chain only. It cannot be received directly. 
Okay, but you haven't really touched on the significance of having sadhu, because the guru may be there and the shastras are there, but there's no sadhus. There's no other sadhus there. Sadhu as in Guru other other devotees? Yes, other devotees? Yes, yes. Sadhus can also be the previous acharyas, but that we, you know, we, we take a lot of help from the previous acharyas, like their commentaries on the scriptures are very valuable for us. Okay, so what if we have simply shastra and sadhu and no guru? What will be the problem there? If we're without the Guru, we just have sadhus and shastra. Without Guru, we cannot uh, achieve the Lord. Yes, uh, Guru is necessary to connect to the Lord. So, uh, we can, uh, only Guru can connect us to the succession, yes, uh, to Krishna. So, uh, if we only have the shastra and other uh, shiksha gurus, but not uh, diksha guru, then we cannot be get uh, connected to the Krishna. Mm. Well, Sadhu may also take you to Krishna, couldn't he? Yeah, but the formally uh, acceptance of the disciple. Yes, would someone else like to contribute something here? Yeah, Maharaj, uh, the uh, disciples. Uh, Activities are directly monitored by Guru. Anything, disciple, anything uh, he's doing, even uh, wrong and all, it, it, it can affect Guru but not the Sadhu. So there's a relation, there's a relation between the disciple and Guru that cannot have with the, with the Sadhu. So. Uh, okay, there's a, a deeper connection between the Guru than with the Sadhus. That, that may be true, yes. Uh, something else? Uh, Maharaj, uh, um, Guru is the confidential servitor of uh, Lord Sri Krishna and he is the only one who can reveal um, the subject matters uh, understood clearly to us. Uh, well, sadhus may also do that. I don't think you can just simply say only Guru can do that. Sadhus can also do that. Uh, probably uh, we can take the Guru's words more seriously and sincerely to cultivate our uh, devotional service. Uh, we may hear the sadhus but, and we may read the shastras but we may not put it into practice that is the Guru uh, stands there uh, for us to really cultivate this Krishna consciousness uh, which we will also be, there will be a personal interaction therefore between the Guru and the which helps us to accept the words of the Shastra and the Sadhus. Okay. It makes it happen. The link is done by the Yeah, there's a, certainly there's a stronger connection between the, the, the Sadhaka and the Guru. And that when the Guru gives some instruction, then the Sadhu will take it with, you know, more seriously. Sadhu, you know, there are many Sadhus, many different <laughs> Sadhu-like devotees. And so you can go from one to the other and you can take one, you know, you didn't like this one, you go to another one. But Guru is someone who, you know, has that right to fix us and to keep us in our position and to uh, direct us in our Krishna consciousness, right? We have given that authority, we've set, submitted ourselves 
to the Guru, accepting him as our, our guide. So they have a greater power. And that it's important for us in our devotional practice. So we we do need three. We need all we need to have sadhu, shastra and guru. So therefore we see Lord Krishna here in this particular verse tonight. He's mentioned those things. He's mentioned that this knowledge of the field of activities and the knower of activities is described by various sages, Rishi B, Bahuda, and then Chando B. Chando B meaning the, 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 the Vedic hymns, the scriptures. So the knowledge of uh, whether or not there's oneness or duality is discussed in these scriptures. And particularly, Lord Krishna is saying, it is especially presented in Vedanta Sutra, with all reasoning as to cause and effect. So, we're not against Vedanta Sutra. But we accept, of course, Srimad Bhagavatam as being the commentary on Vedanta Sutra. People were criticizing Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that you are a sannyasi, you should be studying Vedanta. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was already knowing Vedanta and he presented Vedanta to them and he convinced them of the, the, the real nature of Vedanta philosophy by presenting this knowledge. So, uh, in this purport, it then goes on, there's a discussion about uh, the different, what it's called, the um, the five different descriptions of the Absolute Truth, or five different levels of Brahman, Brahmapucham pra, pra, Pratishta, this Brahmapucham, the five different kinds of Brahman are described. This is relevant because in the beginning Arjuna wanted to know about the field of activities. So there are three different levels of Brahman which are related to the, the field of activities. Uh, the three different, the, 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 the five different levels are mentioned here. They begin first of all with what is called Anamaya. Ana, of course, meaning grains, uh, food. Anamaya, simply made of food. Prabhupada gave example about Anamaya. He said, just like little baby, when they're born, they only know food. They get some food, they drink the milk from their mother's breast, then they go to sleep. They get food, then they go to sleep. They're just eating and sleeping, like that. And the cow, the cow's business. The cow doesn't do any work. They eat some grass and then they rest. Of course, they drink also a lot of water. But like that, their level of consciousness is simply based on food. So that's the lowest level of consciousness. We're simply concerned about our own existence of the body. To maintain the body, there has to be food. So this is Anamaya. Then a little higher than Anamaya comes Pranamaya where life symptoms develop in the body. Not just simply eating and sleeping, but life symptoms. The body starts to become more aware of the different limbs and the different organs within the body. Prana, the, the energy within the body is there, awakened. And then that consciousness develops more to uh, Manamaya or Jnanamaya, where one starts to think, 
different feelings come in the mind, different desires, thoughts. So these three levels are all related to the body, the field of activities, the body. And higher still, you have Vigyana Maya, where you start to un you understand something different from the body. That I'm not just simply the body, but I'm within this body. Some awareness of the soul comes. And then the perfection of that consciousness is Ananda Maya, where we understand there's a supreme. This we have some uh, awareness that there's also the Supreme Lord within the body, not just simply only our own self. So these five different levels, this Brahmapucham, are mentioned there in this purport. This is something which we, we should know, we're expected to know these five different terms. Before we go on, I want to look at some of Prabhupada's quotes about these uh, different verses. We have Prabhupada's quotes here. Just a minute. Mm -hmm. Let me... Yeah, we want to be familiar with the different analogies which are given here. I bring your attention to them. Uh, in text number 3, go back to text number 3, the second paragraph, oh, is that? Prabhupada writes, he gives an example, he said, uh, a citizen may know everything about his patch of land, but the king knows not only his palace, but all the properties possessed by the individual citizens. This is the second paragraph, text number three, the purport. The king knows not only his palace, but all the properties possessed by the citizens. Similarly, one may be the proprietor of the body individually, but the Supreme Lord is the proprietor of all bodies. The king is the original proprietor of the kingdom, and the citizen is the secondary proprietor. Similarly, the Supreme Lord is the supreme proprietor of all bodies. So that's one example which Prabhupada gives there. Uh, 
in text number four, or rather number three, he gives the example about not a king but a landlord. He said, the landlord has got many houses. The Kshetragna means the possessor of the Kshetra. The body, the owner as occupier. So Prabhupada says, you, me and every one of us, we are occupying each one body. But I have no business with your body, but Krishna has got business with your body, my body, his body, everyone's body. Therefore Krishna says, Shetra Jam Chapi Mam Vidi. Just like a landlord, he has got many houses. The occupier is there or apartment. He is concerned with that apartment or the house he is occupying. But the landlord has concern with so many houses. Similarly, this body, I am the occupier. God has given me this body, this machine, but proprietor is the Lord, the Supreme Lord. Therefore both of us have, have got concern with the body. Prabhupada gives another example where he talks about the painting the painter and the easel. That's also important to understand. Uh, it's mentioned this mentioned in the uh, purport of text number three, paragraph one, two, three, yeah, third paragraph, one, two, three, third paragraph, Prabhupada writes there, one should not confuse the three in different capacities. The three, oh, Prabhupada said, first, one has to understand the position of Prakriti, Purusha and Ishwara, the owner who dominates or controls nature and the individual soul. One should not confuse the three in their different capacities. One should not confuse the painter, the painting and the easel. So, this is a good exercise for all of you. We will ask you, can you tell us which one is the painter, which one is the painting and which one is the easel between the pra pra Prakriti, Purusha and Ishwara? Can you identify the relationship with the painting, the painter and the easel? Let's take a poll. Let's see how many of you have identified correctly. Everyone agree? Everyone agree? Ishwara is a painter? Any objection? Okay. Ishwara or Purusha? The, um, the, well, the, the Supreme Purusha, yeah. And then which one is the painting? Sorry? I want to know which the oh you're saying prakriti is the painting? Yes. Everybody agree? 
Uh, some other, anybody body. else? Uh, body, the field. The field of activities? The body? Well, that's Prakriti. So you're saying Prakriti? Everyone agree? What's, which one's the painting? Prakriti. Is that the... Prakriti is the easel, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Prakriti is the easel. Yes, Prakriti is the easel. Yes. And the living and entity. The, painting. the, the painting is the Purusha. The painting, well, Purusha, be careful about Purusha because there's, we've got two Purushas, right? <laughs> so there's the, the Jiva or the Ish. There's the Jiva, the Ishwara. Yeah, Prabhupada spoke about the three. He said uh, there's the Ishwara, the Purusha. Okay, it says Purusha, Prakriti, the enjoyer of nature, the Purusha and Ishwara. Okay, so Purusha is the living entity, the Jiva. Yes, the, the Jiva is the painting and the Prakriti is the easel. Material nature, holding the field, it's providing the arrangement for the field of action of the living entities. Prabhupada writes, this material world, which is the field of activities, is nature, and the enjoyer of nature is the living entity. And above them both is the supreme controller. So the living entity, we are trying to easel. So this way we understand the relationship between the, the, the three important points. Okay, so we'll go on. Text number six and seven. Describing text six and seven, the five great elements false ego, intelligence, the unmanifested, the ten senses in the mind, the five sense objects desire, hatred, happiness, distress, the aggregate, the life symptoms, and convictions all these are considered in summary to be the field of activities and its interactions. So, what we have here, this is a description of the field of activity, uh, the body, the different elements. Let's see, where's my notes? Um, yeah, okay. Okay, so here you can see these uh, different elements, how they've been arranged, the components of the world can be understood. First of all here, we have the five Mahabhutis, Mahabhuta elements, earth, water, fire, air and ether, right, the gross elements. And here, the five sense objects. Ether has the element of sound. Air has the qualities of sound and touch. Fire possesses the quality of sound, touch and form. Water possesses all four qualities, taste, form, touch and sound. And earth has all five of the different 
sense objects there within air. So when, you, when we see the presentation of the elements like this, the subject of course is discussed a lot in Srimad Bhagavatam, particularly in the second and third canto, subject matter of creation. And we can see how very systematically and scientifically the creation is made according to the Vedic philosophy. And we should note also creation comes about from sato to gross. In the beginning, the first element is sound. Srila Prabhupada heard a statement from a biblical text which said, in the beginning was the word. And when Prabhupada heard this, then Prabhupada said, yes, he said, this is our philosophy. Creation comes from subtle to us. First element is sound. With ether comes sound. So these are the gross elements and these come about from the transformation of the false ego and the mode of ignorance. It produces these different elements. The subtle elements, the mind and intelligence. We have also what is called the pradhan. Pradhan means the unmanifested stage of the material elements. The elements have to come into being. So from the pradhan, it becomes prakriti. Pradhan, meaning the unmanifested stage. And five knowledge acquiring senses nose, tongue, eyes, ears. Generally, we know about these the five knowledge acquiring senses. We're not so familiar with five working senses, but they're also part of the subject matter of creation. Five working senses the voice, the legs, the hands creating organ and the procreating organ, as they are described by Srila Prabhupada. In addition to that, you have something called the aggregate, which is the total of the field of activities. So this is all the 24 elements of the material body. The field of activity, that shitra, is made up of these things. That's verse number six. Then verse seven goes on to describe the changes of the, the qualities of the mind mentioned here. Seven qualities of mind derived from the interaction of the 24 elements. The seven qualities of the mind mentioned here uh, desire, hatred, happiness, distress, these things, the aggregate life symptoms, convictions, all these are considered to be the field of activities and its interactions. So I was telling you that the interaction desire, hatred, happiness, distress, these things, all these in summary are the field of activities. We are living in this body. We should know what are the elements of the body. Prabhupada writes in the purport, just reading towards the end there, second last paragraph, one who desires to know the 24 elements in detail along with their interactions should study the philosophy in more detail. In the Bhagavad Gita a summary only is given. Yeah, you want to study it more? You can read Third Canto Srimad Bhagavatam. It's very well presented in the Kapila Siksha, the Sankhya philosophy of Kapila. Very analytical presentation is given, very great detail. 
Here in Bhagavad Gita, this Prabhupada used to say Bhagavad Gita ABC, basic knowledge. So 24 elements have been, it's an expansion earlier. We, so this is the subject matter of the field of activities. Okay, so uh, we don't want to go any further tonight. I just wanted to take the class up to text number seven. Any questions? Together. So the aggregate is where you put everything together. You have the, from the unmanifest stage, you have the manifest stage. You have something called the aggregate, where everything is just mixed up. From the pradhan, it becomes mahatattva. The mahatattva is like the aggregate. It's just the mixing of everything. You know, when you cook, you know cooking? You know, probably you know kitchari, right? You know kitchari, you, you have rice, you have dal, you have sabji, you have oil, spices, it all goes in. Mix it all up, you know, that's the kitchari. So that's the aggregate, everything together, nothing separated. But then separate off the different elements, the different elements of creation are all there, they're all identified. But still you have the aggregate, you know. Every, of a, the whole thing mixed up, everything together, the mixing of all the elements. Uh, can we can understand the Tukhraji as an interaction of all these uh, elements with each other? Sorry? Can we understand this, uh, under, understand this philosophy? as a uh, uh, interaction of uh, uh, these elements with each other and producing something else as an aggregate? Well, not producing something else, you know, th that's it, it's just the, the, the original nature that these things are there, they're, 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 uh, initially they're all mixed up. Or, you know, when, when you're taking something off, there'll be something left there. There will be some residual, you know, that is going to be there. You take off the water, you take off the, the oil, you know, the other things are still there. And there will still be a little water there, there will still be a little oil there, it will still be remaining. So the aggregate is like that. It's what's, you know, mixed up, everything mixed up together, the different elements there. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, already in the 12th chapter Krishna has spoken about the field of activity uh, as a body, what and all we should be doing and uh, cultivate our Bhakti Yoga. Why is Arjuna again asking in detail these questions, what is the body, who is the Lord Shetra and Shetra? What is the connection between the 12th and the 13th? How do we connect the chapters? Maharaj? We're going to come to hear about the modes of nature. We, want, we have to understand the body, how it's also affected by the modes of nature. Thank you, Maharaj. And can I also ask one more question, if somebody else is not asking? Uh, in the purport of the 6th and the 7th, uh, it looks too technical, uh, Maharaj. The five great elements are a gross representation of the false ego, which in turn represents the primal stage of false equal, technically called the materialistic conception of Kamsa. Uh, it looks too uh, technical to understand what is this uh, gross representation of the false ego, which is in the purport of the sixth and the seventh. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. You read that uh, one who desires just previous to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It looks yeah. too technical. Yeah, there is some technical points here. The five great elements are a gross representation of the false ego, which in turn 
represents the primal stage of false ego, technically called the materialistic conception. Tamasa, buddhi, intelligence and ignorance. Yeah. So, you, you have to understand the process of creation, you see. It's coming about by the, this false ego in ignorance, interacting. And it's from the false ego in ignorance that the five elements come about. It's the false ego that can be influenced by passion, by goodness, passion and ignorance. And according to which mode of nature, false ego in the mode of good, intelligence comes from ego in the mode of passion, and the different elements, they all come about from false ego in the mode of ignorance. So, when you study this subject matter later on, in the third canto and second canto Bhagavatam, you, it's explained, you will understand it better. Here Prabhupada touches on only briefly, he says this tamasabuddhi, intelligence in ignorance. So the false ego in ignorance, bringing out the, the five gross elements, the five great elements, false ego. Right? Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. So, uh, uh, so put it simply, what we are saying is that the false ego is the root of the false ego and then the five elements came and the other things came. Is it like that? Yes. You're very clever. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> how it all came about. Very good. Hmm. Okay, any other questions? Hare Krishna Prabhu, the five stages of Brahman realization, I did not understand that. Prabhu. Okay. Namaya, you gave example. Yeah, you but want... For the rest, you did not give example. Oh, okay, let me see. I have a nice quote here from the Krishna book. If you... Uh, if we look in the Krishna book, there is a oh, there was a good quote there about it. Um, where is it? I have to find it for you. Wait, I'll just try to explain it to you myself. Uh, okay, so uh, you, Anamaya you're clear about, right? Hare Krishna? Hare Krishna? Anamaya clear. Okay, can you hear now? Are you yes, hear? Prabhu, I can hear. Okay, so you're clear about Anamaya. You understand that principle, all right, yeah? Y yes, yes, Prabhu. So we want to explain to you about the next one, Pranamaya. Pranam 
pranamaya, understanding the living symptoms within the body, that there's life within the body. Pranamaya, Prabhupada explains, after the Absolute Truth in food, one can realize the Absolute Truth in the living symptoms, in life forms. Life forms, we start to see, as, as we come to a higher level of consciousness, we're no longer just simply thinking of food. Are you hearing me all right? Yes, Prabhu, I am. Okay, so we're no longer just thinking of food, but we actually notice people and we observe differences. We see different people and we relate to them in different ways. And you can see that development in the child, how young children, they can, you know, they, they recognize their mother. They have, there's people they're familiar with. Somebody they're not familiar with, the child cries because you know, I never saw this person before. So this is pranamaya, they're starting to make distinction between one living and one form of life and another. This is pranamaya. All right? And then on a higher level, still higher, we come to what's called jnanamaya. In jnanamaya, realization extends beyond the living symptoms to the point of thinking, feeling and willing. So thinking, feeling and willing, that of course this is the activity of the mind. The desires of the mind come in this thinking, feeling and willing. You think, we begin to think about something, we think more, we want it more thinking, we have more feeling, stronger feeling, and then willing, we want it very badly, I want it so much. We, so like that, the, the attachment to things. This is jnana maya, or sometimes we say mana maya. Yeah, because it's the mind, thinking, feeling, willing. In the beginning, it's just the tongue. So these three levels of realization, they're all concerned with the field of activity, with the body. But the next one is Vigyana Maya. And Prabhupada explains Vigyana Maya here in Bhagavad Gita. You can find this also, it's a, I, I, I've lost a quote here, absolutely, but it's in the Krishna book. Uh, if you refer to it, if you do a search on it, you'll find it there in the Krishna book, in the prayers of the personified Vedas. So, Vigyana Maya, Prabhupada explains, then there is Brahman realization called Vigyana Maya in which the living entity's mind and life symptoms are distinguished from the living entity himself. Right? The living entity himself, of course, means the soul. But the mind and life symptoms, this is related, this is the body. So, Vigyana Maya is to understand, you, you, you've come to realize, you appreciate, I'm not the body, I'm a soul. So th this is an important point. And it's a very difficult point to actually get through to people. And that's maybe why this point is being discussed again. Because Srila Prabhupada presented this point over and over and over to us again and because it's so basic but it's so difficult to get through, to pick, to actually understand the difference between the person and the body. We're so attached to this body. And that's why you could, maybe this is why it's being discussed again. Because Krishna wants to reinforce this to Arjuna. And Arjuna, it's Arjuna who brought the question up. It wasn't Krishna. Arjuna wanted to hear it again because he, wasn't, he, was, he, he just wants to be fully convinced himself. Prabhuji, 
Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. There's a small question here. Uh, when you were explaining about the elements, the gross, the, the Bhuta elements, the, the major five great elements, you told that ether is representing the element of sound, air is representing the element of sound and touch, fire is representing sound, touch, and form. Did you say form? Yes. I did. It's form, okay. And then water, it includes taste. Yes. And then earth, in earth, what is the fifth thing which is added? Smell. Smell, smell, yeah, okay. Fine, thank you. We can see how... Related to our sense organs. Related to our sense organs. Yes. Five sense objects and with the development of the different elements. We can see very systematic scientific development of the elements of creation. We don't find such a complete description in any other philosophy. Okay, any other questions? Everyone satisfied tonight? Is it? No other questions, Prabhus, managers? So, we, so we're going to we'll go on on Tuesday night. We'll meet again. The next class, the section is from text number eight up to we'll be up to. Uh, does anyone remember? It's up to 12. Oh, only, only 12. 8 to 12? Yes, next session, Maharaj, is 8 to 12. Okay. Well, we'll try to go a bit further. We'll see how it goes. Of course, there's a lot of deep, a lot of information there. We have to go, we'll go through it. We'll see how it goes. Anyway, we have, I think, three or four days on this uh, third chapter. All right, Prabhu, so thank you very much. So we'll meet again on uh, Tuesday evening at the same time. So thank you, Maharaj. If you can thank look, you for your time. If you can look, over, if you can look over these uh, verses before we meet, any questions you may like to have also on what we discussed this evening then please bring them up. So thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you very much for your time and your wonderful class. And uh, uh, I'm sure the students will all do preparation before they come into the class next time. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. Maharaj, just a quick ask. I see that whenever you're reading a book, you wear that special spectacles. I know that you've shown it to me once before. Can yeah. you quickly tell us, before we get bored, that we should also buy one? <laughs> <laughs> well, these are, these are Ayurvedic glasses, actually. Ayurvedic glasses. The idea is that the exercise the eyeball. They're just simply a screen. It's a screen and it makes the eyeball move. And it, in this way, exercise the, uh, the eye. Whereas just ordinary glasses make your eye lazy. But when, you, when I use these ones, I find I, I can see better than with the, with the eye glasses. So, okay, they've got small pinholes I've seen in the before. Yeah, yeah, just pinholes, yeah. So Is there's, they in India, Uh No, I, I got them actually. I got, I got these screens in, in Hong Kong. But they're available in India also. I've got, I've got one pair from India also. But this ones I'm using just now, they're from Hong Kong. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Divya Chakshu, I think you're wearing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hare Thank Krishna. you very much. Uh, I appreciate all, all of you devotees who participated here today. Just as an etiquette, I want to say that, uh, uh, you know, some of you address Maharaj as Prabhu. It will be 
good to address Maharaj. I popped in and give you a full introduction. Maharaj is a sannyasi and an initiating guru in the moment. So uh, I, I know you're doing it because you're not aware. So I thought I should just mention that you can address Maharaj as Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.